Okay, chemists, we're going to do a very quick little lesson about a molecular formula versus an empirical formula, and then I'm going to do a small sample problem. So I have here these different objects, uh, R for red, Y for yellow, and pretend that this is some sort of molecule over here. What I want you to notice is that I'm going to say that my molecular formula would be six R's and three Y's. The empirical formula, I want to remind you, is just the simplest whole number ratio. And what we're about to do is we're about to take a look at problems where I would be given some information about mass, and I want to find this empirical formula here. So the reality is, is that as chemists, we really need to do a lot of our work with numbers of things. So these are useful to us. We like these. When it comes time to measure things, often we get stuck because these are so small. And when we measure things, mass is one of the things that we can get some access to some information about. So the reality, I didn't make the measurements on these, but I'm going to approximate that probably 80 to 90 percent of the mass of everything that's over here is tied up in these marbles. And so somebody could tell me, I'm going to use 90, hey, 90% of the mass over here is marble, 10% of the mass are these little fluffy red things, and I'm going to need to make my measurement that way, but I want to convert it to numbers of things. So to do that, I have to know what is the mass of one red thing and what is the mass of one marble. The process of doing that conversion is kind of a standard type of problem that you'll see. And so here's a sample problem. You can take a moment to read it. Pause if you need to. But in this problem, we're going to say that we have some knowledge that I have a compound that's 8.74% carbon, this percent chlorine, and this percent fluorine by mass. This is the way the information would come to us. But I want to know what is the empirical formula? What is the simplest ratio that I would have? Notice in this problem, it doesn't tell me how much material I have. It just tells me the percent by mass. So what I'm going to do, you can always feel free to do this. There's a simplicity to these types of problems where you can assume that you have 100 grams of material. And if I have 100 grams of material, I'm going to immediately come over here. And I'm going to say for carbon, I have 8.74 grams of material. I'm going to come down here and for chlorine, I'm going to say that I have 77.43 grams of material. And then I have fluorine as well and 13.83 grams. So you'll often see on my keys, I kind of stack my, my uh, information like this and I'm going to work over in this direction. So I will often say divide by molar mass up here and just give you the next number. But what I'm doing when I when I do that, I'm going to come down here and grab some, maybe I'll actually, I'm going to grab a separate piece of paper for a second. So 8.74 grams of carbon. I'm going to divide by molar mass. And so that's going to be 12.01 grams of carbon for every one mole of carbon. And when I do that, I'm going to come over here. I also have my little handy dandy calculator. 8.74 divided by 12.01. That's going to be 0 0.72. I'm going to round that to 8 moles of carbon from grams canceling there. So I do this across the board, each for its unique molar mass. And so I'm pulling my molar masses from my handy dandy. This is the AP Chemistry. Uh, periodic table. So I'm going to be pulling, it might be hard for you to see, 12.01, um, uh, fluorine's going to be 19, and chlorine's going to be 35.45. And so I'll say divide by molar mass here. This one we already did. This is 0 0.728 mole. This is for carbon. Divide by the molar mass of chlorine specifically so this is 77.43 divided by 35.45 2.18 
mole. And then I need to do the same for fluorine, which is 0 0.728 rounded. Okay, so remember, I was doing this for each type of thing's molar mass. These are the ratios. This is what would lead me to an empirical formula. And in fact, you can see that this number is, is equal to that number up there, meaning that for every one carbon, there's one fluorine. You, know, you tend to get these sloppy numbers like this. So the next step is simply not a chemistry move. It's more of just a mathematics. We're just trying to find the common whole numbers. And so the strategy is divide by small. Now we're just doing that to rescale, resize all of our numbers here. Now this time divide by small means that I'm gonna divide by, I'm gonna pick the one smallest number because it's just convenient to do this. And when I divide all the numbers by the one smallest, one of them is definitionally gonna be exactly one. So if I divide all numbers by this, I'm gonna get one. It looks like if I divide this guy by that same small number, it's also going to be 1. If I do 2.18 divided by small, I'm going to get, in this case, I get 2.99. Now, all of these types of problems have some sort of rounding that's happening here. So you need to allow yourself to round a little bit on this type of thing. This is going to be a 3. And what I've discovered is C1Cl3, right? We're calling this a 3, uh, F1. This is effectively my empirical formula for this particular thing. Now, a chemist would probably write this CCl3F. We have a tendency where we put the most electronegative thing on the back, on the right-hand side. Um, the least electronegative over here. That doesn't always hold true, um, but this is what I would write for my final empirical formula. Just a small note, sometimes when you do this step up here, divide by small, you end up with things that are not as close as you might think to a whole number. For example, you might see something like a 1.5, and what that means is you need to do one more step of rescaling everything. So if this had been a 1, a 1.5, and a 1, that 1.5 is now going to need to be rescaled. And so I would double everything. So it would be a 2, a 3, and a 2, if you track what I was saying. But anyways, this is my number for that empirical formula.